It's my pleasure to uh, welcome to House of Kunz, Kendall Kears, the artist uh, who is currently based in Brussels and has lived and worked in Brussels since the year 2000. It also is my pleasure to welcome the curator of the exhibition, Clive Kellner. Clive Kellner was the director of the Johannesburg Art Gallery, the main museum of the city of Johannesburg. It's a historical institution. Call it a kind of, you know, a mini encyclopedic, encyclopedic museum, you know, with um, collections ranging from the Renaissance to uh, African art objects and so on. Um, Kellner currently, uh, you know, works as you know, curator at large and consultant for a new um, institution, uh, the Gordon Sharkett, um, you know, Museum of um, uh, African Art, that is in the process of development in Johannesburg, one of the first museums of its kind to be developed on the African continent. Um, um, in, in, well, one of the first, that's not, you know, a state institution. And so I will hand over to Clive, who is the curator of the exhibition. We are very, very pleased and grateful to Clive for um, coming on board as a guest curator at House Kunst. And I hope that, you know, Clive's, um, you know, comments and tour of the exhibition will help elucidate uh, parts of um, the understanding of Kendall Gizzi's work. So thank you so much. I looked at the exhibition in terms of the period he spent in South Africa and the period he has spent in Europe. And this was the fundamental approach to curating the exhibition. Um, there are two significant parts, 1988 to the year 2000, which is uh, defined as politically as the period in South Africa, and the period from 2000 to 2012, Kendall spent living and working in Europe is how it's been described as a more poetic. To introduce the exhibition, I wanted to create an archive, um, and we're going to move through the room into the archive, and I just want to describe and talk to some of the elements if, in that room. So if we could all move into the first room. Okay, the first, the, the archive is really an introduction to the exhibition. It's not to provide a framework, um, or what you're going to see upstairs, which is three rooms. The first room around South Africa and the political period. The second is a major installation for post-pagan punk pop. And the third room is the European period, described as the poetic. On the wall is an artwork called TWCV. It is the artist's curriculum vita, but it is also an artwork. Um, and the artwork for the CV starts with the date 1652, which is the advent of Jan van Rieburg arriving at the Cape Colony and declaring it a Dutch colony. And this is a fundamental point uh, of which the early political work and Kendall's identity and artist spurns off the state. It's an important historical moment. If you look at the CV, there are a number of historical events, um, philosophical um, writers, uh, intellectual moments uh, in it and some of the personal issues and personal moments in Kendall's life. So working with this idea of the CV as a template, as a, a backbone to the exhibition, there are three cabinets in the exhibition. The first cabinet is personal objects of Kendall Gears. There are objects in there which relate to his life and to his identity. And the fundamental question relates to the artist's persona, the artist's personality and identity related to politics related to how he sees the world and interprets and make objects that are socially and politically embedded. So the first is the personal, the second is the political cabinet that contextualizes some of the artworks upstairs related to political events in South Africa. And the third cabinet relates to literature, literary influences that have influenced the artist. So let me describe, because there are a lot of people, it's quite difficult to do each object, but in the first cabinet there's the death certificate of Kendall's grandfather. Jacobus Hendrik, Jacobus, Jacobus, Jacobus Hermanus Peter Gears. Thank you. And um, if you link that, if you take that name, that's a Dutch origin name, in 1652, that is the advent of the Dutch arriving in South Africa. Yeah, with a series called Suburbia, a photographic series, 
that Kendall made actually the 80 images in the full series. We've selected to show 48, just given uh, space considerations. The work was shown at uh, the documenta that Ocui curated uh, several years ago, I think it was 2002. These images, uh, Kendall made a series looking at um, the security elements, the gates, the barbed wire, the security signage that you find on homes in Johannesburg suburb. Okay, Kendall's going to talk to some of the work as well. I just want to point out a couple of key elements. Um, in some of the works over here, for example, we start to see the introduction of barbed wire. It's on the fences of the homes. You see Bob Wire on the fence that's installed in the gallery. Behind you on the floor is the first early Bob Wire work called Flat Wrap, and it moves into the larger fence installation, and then the, this, um, the fence gets aesthetic, aestheticized as it moves through into big installations like post pagan punk pop. And on the CV, you'll see the dates 1890 and 1894 is the Anglo Boer War in South Africa. And this is the first time the British forces made concentration camps where 65,000 Boer men, women, and children were killed in these camps using the barbed wire. Um, the second element within these is the signage, the security signs. And you'll see it on installation corner piece. Same security signs come into these elements in his work. Um, thank you all for your time. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, <coughs> a lot of my work references multiple themes or mul multi multiple quotations all at the same time. Uh, the work is sometimes deceptive by its simplicity. But don't get taken in by that. There's another level, and the more you search, the more you'll find. Um, when I made this work, now the reason why there's 80 in the way, the reason why you see it on a grid like this, is because I was thinking very much about this idea of suburbia, these grids of homes, these grids of homes where people are living in these endless, behind these endless high-rise walls with their, their security, um, in these strange utopias. Um, and of course with this work I was thinking very much about the art historical reference of Dan Graham's Homes for America and what had changed, what made the South Africa that I was living in different than Dan Graham's 1970s. What made the difference between the way homes were constructed in, in 70s American, New Jersey, suburbia and South Africa. Now the interesting thing about the security signs is I started to realize at some point in time that security is not something that is really functional, it's more purely psychological. And I was interested in how we communicate this idea of security, rather than the reality of security. Because in the South Africa I grew up in as a kid, we had these walls that you probably had all over the world, which was just glass on top of the wall. And it's something that I bring back in my work later on. That was a very rudimentary, very basic sign of security at one point in time that people needed to make, them say, make themselves feel safe. As time changed and as the idea of danger changed, they needed to change the idea of security, changing the signs. So what you find here, for instance, in, in a house like this, you, see, you start to see the overlapping of signs, how one generation of security sign is replaced by another generation of security sign because the concept of making yourself feel, the signs you needed to protect yourself changed. And what's fascinating is if you go to Johannesburg today, you'll probably see none of these signs. This work is more than 10 years old, and the sign of danger and the sign of security is completely shifted now into something else. Something quite, they use different images today. So a lot of the work is about this question of signs, symbols, language, and how the things we use to communicate ideas. So the fence indeed, um, now, one day I understood something very, very, very vital and important as a young artist, as a young man in South Africa, and that is I was illegitimate. Indeed, I ran away from home at the age of 15, but I also understood the illegitimacy of an identity. I understood that I was born into a working class white Afrikaans 
South African family. And during apartheid and post-apartheid, this was not something that I could acknowledge, depend upon. My family had been living in Africa for 300 years, but I had not yet become African. And for many people, for many of you, you'd look at me and say, but you're a white guy. How can you call yourself an African? Um, I am an African person. I'm an African artist. And it is this contradiction that I explore. But what is my cultural heritage? What is my identity? What are the values I believe in? What, is, what can I think about my ancestors? Nothing. I can take absolutely nothing from the world I was born into. So at some point in time, I had to reinvent myself. I had to search for an identity. So you see over there the work Bloody Hell. So it's a work from 1990. Because of my political involvement in the anti-apartheid struggle, I had to leave South Africa in 1990 in order to not go to jail. But when Mandela was released, I was able to go back to South Africa. And the first thing I did is I removed the blood off my arm and I washed myself in my blood. So this was a ritual cleansing. It was a baptism. It was a, me giving birth to myself. It was also me trying to take away this white skin. It was me trying to understand what could I become. And of course, the more you wash, the dirtier you get. The more you try to clean yourself with your blood, the worse it gets. And in trying to understand this journey of what it is to be a white South African and reinvent myself, I started to look around me to try and find signs of what made up the world that I was living in. What constructed my identity? What were the things that I could take for granted if it wasn't my family or my heritage or my inheritance? And as Clyde pointed out, I started to think about what makes South Africa different than another country. In the Second Boer War, between the English and the Boers, in the, in the, in the, in the late uh, 19th century, the English did something terrible. They used barbed wire as a weapon. This was the first time in the history of the planet that barbed wire was not used against cattle or horses, but used against humans. The British invented the concentration camp in South Africa. They started at the one side of South Africa and they burnt the entire country and put all the women and children into concentration camps. Many, many thousands died in these concentration camps. And eventually, the country was so decimated, they invented trench warfare there, they invented barbed wire there, they invented um, concentration camps there, and they invented the modern war there. Fast forwarding into the 70s, there was a company in South Africa called Cochrane Steel who invented something called razor mesh, it's sometimes called razor wire, it's called flat trap, it has many different names depending on the, uh, the, the, the use or the, or the whether it's flat or whether it's in a concertina. Or whether... This material was invented to service the military and the police of the apartheid system. Now you'll see downstairs a photograph I took just after a, 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 a neo-Nazi right-wing bomb blast in downtown Johannesburg in 1994. And there you see how it was used. You have this truck, and you have this material behind the truck, and they hold the one side, and the truck drives down the road, and within seconds, you have a six-foot wall that's impenetrable. And what makes razor mesh different than barbed wire is that it attaches itself to you. It will attach itself to your skin, and it holds on to you. It's very difficult to get around. And very famously, many years ago, I said the difference between barbed wire and razor wire is barbed wire is for cattle, razor wire is for humans. This is what is used around the world today to create borders. Now, at some point, I was making so much work with this that the chairman of the company in Johannesburg called me up and wanted to meet me and wanted to know who are you and what are you doing with my material. And I went into his office and I saw the most incredible thing. His wall is behind him, wall to wall, floor to ceiling, were photographed from Time magazine. And he apologized. He said, I, you know, I only started my collection or my, of cuttings in the last year or two. I wish I'd started earlier. And on the wall, I saw every flashpoint in the world. Abu Ghraib prison, Guantanamo Bay, Palestine, Somalia. It was all there. This company is supplying the world with borders and it's coming out of South Africa. So it's an indigenous, authentic African material that's extremely contradictory, like I am. Now, since I've been here, a lot of people say, but wait a minute, this is an African problem. We don't have that in Germany. If 
you look in the catalog, you'll see an image called Deployed, where you see me working with the German military with this material. In Germany, you call it NATO draht, NATO wire. It exists here. But it doesn't exist around your homes like it does in Johannesburg. It exists around your borders. It exists around train stations. It exists around airports. You just have to open your eyes and see it. It's everywhere. So, now, this question of borders, barriers, boundaries, is very central to a lot of my work. And it's this question about the inside and the outside. And borders can be used to exclude people as much as it can be used to exclude ideas. And one of the things I tried to do as an artist, I had a, an exhibition in, 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 in Cologne many years ago called Grenzgänger, border, the, the border runner. Um, and that's very much where a lot of my work situates itself, is on the border between two states of being, between two states of mind, between two identities, being African and European, being white but still African. The self-portrait Heineken beer bottle, we explained the Dutch came to South Africa, the Cape Afrikaans people, Kendall dislocated from that heritage, and the, the beer bottle becomes a matter for this. Beer bottle is designed, it's filled with Dutch contents, comes to South Africa, it gets used, and then it gets discarded. This bottle gets thrown away and it breaks. And what you get is a disembodied head, a disembodied image. It's dislocated, this is the vernacular. See when something transforms from its original into an inauthentic original. There's no longer an original. We don't speak Dutch anymore. We don't look to the Queen of Holland. What for? But we also don't have the same ancestral heritage as perhaps someone who has Zulu Kosa identity. Now we think of design as something purely decorative, but no, it has a political function as well. So the design of the Heineken bottle, the design of the label, the design of the bottle is very significant. And I always compare it to an ideology. My ancestors were sent to Africa by Holland with an ideology in mind, with a program, a genetic, which was, it was a socio-political engineering program. And at some point, that program falls apart and it loses contact and the design is broken. And what you left over is, what's left over is garbage. But the most important thing on the piece of garbage is the word imported. That's what, it's that idea of an inferiority complex, that we drink Heineken beer because it's imported, makes it more special. But it's not, it's broken, it's decapitated, it's discontinued. You know, I love to say when I go to Holland, I know Frankenstein coming back to haunt you. <laughs> so this is a very good example of a lost object. And also remember at the time, as a young militant, I was also using these bricks to throw them at the police. This was a weapon. This is a weapon that we're using as part of the liberation movement, as was this. So these bricks here are called hanging peace. But the double meaning on the word peace, it's not spelled peace as in peace. It's spelled peace as in gun, P-I-E-C, a weapon. It's a hanging weapon. And this was a technique towards the end of apartheid. What would happen was, on the freeways, leading to the, the coastal um, holiday resorts for white, mostly for white people, a lot of disimpoverished people who were living in these shacks, they would take a rock or a brick or some heavy object and suspend it from the bridge over the freeway. And then they would be long gone and the cars would come speeding down the freeway on their way to the holidays and they would hit the brick. So the brick was not moving, the car was moving. And this was a weapon that was used in the anti-apartheid movement putting them like this, hanging where you can enter into it, the work starts to implicate you. As here you change your body in relation to the object to read it, there you walk through it more carefully. And what it does is it implicates you in a greater community because you can walk through there very quickly and very fast and set the bricks in motion without putting, any, without putting yourself in any kind of risk or danger. But what you do is you put the danger to the person behind you. The risk is the person behind you because they're going to get hurt by the brick coming back. And that becomes a very beautiful metaphor for life for me today. The harder you push the brick, you can move away, it's going to come back. And even though I made this work in 1993, very much in the time of apartheid and politics, for me this becomes a metaphor for closer to what I'm doing in the last room for today. The lifestyles we're living, the lifestyles of excess and luxury, the, the, the 
consequence of um, the planet melting down because we all want to have good lives and the consequence of those good lives in the third world the, you'll see on my CV Antarctica is melting icebergs are falling off the North Pole and the South Pole tsunamis earthquakes the consequence of global warming which is our ancestors pushing the bricks too hard Suddenly you in this glass cathedral, this place of light. It's absolutely beautiful. And suddenly you breathe and maybe the weight kind of gets lifted as you move through the space. But you still find the things embedded in it. It's beautiful, it repels, but it attracts at the same time. The Bob way is still dangerous, but it's aestheticized, it's changed. It's not as raw, it's not a found object, it's a transformed lost object. But it has beauty, what the mirror and glass does in this room. You can imagine as a curator, and I'll speak briefly about that, that's my, my function within the exhibition context, the opportunity to have a major installation like this uh, was actually quintessential to the exhibition. And also the support from the house to realize pieces of the scale and complexity, because you can imagine it's a, it's a complex piece put together. But in fact, there are three artworks that have been drawn together in this room. Post-punk pagan pop is the razor my wish razor mesh fences with the mirrors and then there are two the one is a suspended stainless steel the other one as you pass in the entrance is the bronze standing piece and those are monument to the f word um, and then on the walls the mirror pieces are four letter portraits and i wanted to bring that relationship together in this room so the fence you see over there on when you came in is called title withheld exported now i explained to you it was a big export of South Africa, this, this material. So the word exported clearly refers to that, but when you're exported, it's also like being deported. It's the idea of the fence is creating an exclusion. And that fence is very much a division between two parts of the space, two parts of the gallery. What happens when you enter into post-punk pagan pop, you can already tell the change of title signifies a very big shift in the way I'm thinking. And the most important thing that you'll notice is once you enter in here, you see yourself. You're not exported or excluded. You're implicated. You're part of this. We're all part of it. Because even if one chooses not to see, you can choose not to look down or see yourself, but it's there. And as you go through the labyrinth, you make choices to go left or to go right. Occasionally, you'll end up in a dead end and you have to go back again. But more importantly, these are physical choices which have an, an effect on where you end up. But more importantly, you have a psychological, spiritual choice as well, which is what the mirror is. The mirror becomes a metaphor. It becomes a symbol for the choices about entering into another world, a world of spirit. The mirror was a way of entering into the world of the ancestors, the world of the spirits, the world of the gods, the angels, the demons. This is the other world of things we believe in. At the entrance it said, what do you believe in? The world that we believe in. In Europe, in the former century, the mirror pretty much had the same function. You know, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. It was this world of the imagination that we would enter into. Or you would have the, 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 the spiritualist people who would speak to um, people who had died through mirrors, or speak to ghosts through mirrors. Today, in the West, in Europe, United States, and all the developed countries, the mirror is no longer a symbol of spirit. It's a symbol of flesh. It's a symbol of the body, of materialism. And it's a symbol of self-hatred. Because we wake up in the morning and we look in the mirror. It's more or less the first thing we do. And what do we do when we look in the mirror? We hate what we see. We don't like the way we smell. We don't like the way we smell. We put on deodorant. We put on perfume. We brush our teeth. We change the color of our hair because maybe there's one or two hairs that don't look correct. We use shampoo, we use conditioner, we use soap. We take rid of the, we get rid of the wrinkles, we get rid of the blemishes, we get rid of the, we get rid of everything that makes you human. We get rid of everything that makes you an individual. We get rid of everything that makes you special in order to try to all look the same. By buying the products that advertising is proposing, 
that we put on ourselves in order to try and be the same so that those companies can get rich of our vanity by taking advantage of some people in the third world manufacturing those things en masse. And the other thing about the, the pendulum is that it has another F word inside, which is an F word that you will see a lot around the exhibition. And that's the word fuck. Now you will know immediately I'm not using this word in a pejorative way, in a negative way, because I put it on my own face. It's on the big banner outside the museum, it's on the invitation. I've taken this word and I've painted myself in it. So it's obviously a word that I have respect for. I have respect for it, why? I have respect because it's one of the last magic words. It's one of the last, I'm from the brick all the way through, language has preoccupied me. Um, fuck is important because it still will get a reaction. If you use this word, it's still forbidden on American television, it's still forbidden on official English television. You still cannot say it on MTV. And most important, it's still not a perfume. <laughs> That's how you know it's powerful. But like a lot of my work, this attraction and repulsion is important, the creative and the destructive. The missile going up and the missile coming down, this contradiction, this, because fuck can be positive or negative. If I say fuck you, that's a declaration of war. That's going to get you very angry. You're going to have a reaction. If I say fuck me, that's an invitation. That's something beautiful. That's how we make babies. That's how we were all born. That's how we come into the world. Now, of course, it's a four-letter word, and that's how you know it's a working-class word. The reason why people get angry is because it's also, fuck is not the same as intercourse, or copulation, or making love. No, that's what educated people say, because they're afraid of the earth. They're afraid of the roots. Fuck is a word of the street, and it's a word of the earth, to say the same thing. And that's why I use it, so. And you will probably spend a long time Try to search for the, the letters. If you look, I mean, people never see the word. So I'll give you a, a clue. <laughs> so one of the things I do, as you're standing on the mirror, the alchemists would say, as above, so below. Nietzsche said, when you fight, when you look into the abbess, the abbess looks into you. He said, when you fight a monster, be careful and become a monster. So this, this idea of the double is, uh, you see it all over my work. So what I do is I take the word fuck and I fold it together four times. So the fracture lettering downstairs that will have Hitler rolling in his grave says fuck. In the forbidden typeface. It's folded together. And that way when you're folding it, the word becomes flesh. The, Im the, the text becomes image. And that way, it's speaking to your rational brain reading, but it's also speaking to your animal brain as an image. And over here is a skull of an African gentleman that was killed with a bullet wound uh, some time ago, a century or so back. These four objects, all skulls, um, Kendall has put it, uh, explained it in the most fantastic way, and I'm just totally going to appropriate it and say it in front of him because it's so wonderful. This is the effluence, this is the detritus that comes after the colonial imperialist project. Each of these objects were bought in the flea market of Brussels by Kendall. So you have 400 years of colonization, 400 of plowing, raping, plundering, taking from the various third world countries. You bring it into Western Europe and the end of the imperialist project is like, oops, oh sorry, we've made a mistake. The King of Belgium took Congo is his birthday present. Oh, we've done really wrong. We no longer like that. It's, it's all over. And then this stuff just spills out. It just kind of gets washed up. And this is the power of the totem object or the fetish object. Fetish object there. The language becomes a fetish. And these power objects. The second, the skull in art history is such an important symbol. It's the vanitas object. Remember you will die from the Latin, vanitas. And you see it in so many historical paintings. As a curator to come across that kind of symbol in the artist's work and look at the portrait of Kendall. It's one of the most frightening images. I even get nervous around Kendall. And I've known him for 25 years and I come and I look. That eye is watching you, he's looking into you. And this is the opposite. There's no human personification. 
we don't know the person. But again, the transcribing of the text onto the object, it's, it's, it's absolutely iconic images. I made this work in China. So we have here my tribal object that I kind of imagined, my animistic object working with resin. It's, it's, it's plastic. It's a byproduct of oil. So the oil industry goes to service your car so we can drive around and have a good time. But then there are a lot of byproducts from that, plastic being the most part. You know, your shoes are probably a byproduct of oil. And most things, plastic. And there's a, there's a huge industry that is being created by these byproducts. And when I was working on this exhibition, it was at the time of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And I felt very, very touched and traumatized by these images of the birds and the animals with the oil dripping off them. And I wanted to also make my protest or make my voice known in relation to what was going on. And I decided from the logic of the way I've been working now, which is different from how it started, because now it's much more animistic, is to try to give an image to the spirit of oil, an image to the demon of oil. So using the byproduct of oil plastic, I've created these demons, and I put them on the shiny, slick, beautiful black oil drum, so you can also see where it's coming from. And this relationship between how things are exported in a clean way, but they're actually very ugly inside. And the last thing over there is, before you ask, that's the word believe. And I think it's very beautiful that I'm very happy that Clive also decided not to make the priority at the final point of the show an F word, but he chose the word believe because as in the catalog, the last page in the catalog is the word hope. As with believe, we can't allow ourselves to despair just because people like Obama are castrated by the big businesses and by the money in the world. We can't allow ourselves to despair that politicians are unable to take us to a better future because big business has a different agenda. I, the, it's very important for me that one keeps the faith, that one continues to believe. And if you start in the morning, when you look in that mirror, by not hating yourself, that simple gesture to maybe use a little bit less perfume, a little bit less cream, a little bit less of the things which are not really necessary, you probably will go a long way to changing the world. It starts within, and it starts with believing in yourself, loving yourself, loving what you are, not what you could be.